listening to Beyond the Restaurant Podcast, where you'll hear strategies from successful restaurant owners and experts to help you create a thriving business. Here's your host, Andrew Carlson. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Restaurant Podcast. We have an incredible guest here today. I have Donald Burns, the restaurant coach, here with us today. Donald, Thank you so much for coming in and coming on the show and taking the time to speak to the audience. So oh, I want you to tell us a little bit about your story, a little bit about your background and the inspiration behind your book, Your Restaurant Sucks. Embrace the <laughs> suck, unleash the restaurant and become outstanding. Yes, yes. It's been a long road. It's been a very long road. So I grew up in the business, like a lot of people in the restaurant industry. My father, was actually my, my grandmother I uh, owned a small diner and when I was a little kid. I think my first job was like when I was a little, little boy, I'd stand on top of a milk crate. I'm pretty tall now, but back then I'd stand on top of a milk crate and like I'd, I'd cook eggs for her and stuff like that. And one of the most endearing stories of my grandmother is I remember one day I was standing there and she, it's, a, it's a Friday and she is, you know, old fashioned register. She opens the machine up and she takes the tape out, the register tape out. And she goes, today's grandma's money. <laughs> so I'm like... <laughs> I didn't think about it back then, but now I'm like, oh, my God, my grandma was skimming from the government. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Oh, and then my father was a chef, so I grew up working in restaurants. And when I was uh, 15, I told him I wanted to work in his restaurant. He says I wasn't ready. So he got me a job down the street um, at a Chinese restaurant washing dishes. And so I was washing dishes for like six months. And one night I'm working and these guys are like yelling at each other. You know, a really, really loud voice, and I, I look around the corner, and I see this this big rat, like, walking across the floor, and the one chef walks over with his big old Chinese meat cleaver, wow, chops its head off. I'm, I'm just, like, appalled, right? Hmm. Yeah, I look like you did right there. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what? What? And so, you know, I, I think I turned, like, you know, white as a ghost, and I went home that night, and my, my dad asked me, you know, so how'd it go? You know, what's, what's wrong? You know, what's up? And I told him the story, and then he said to me, quote, you ready to come work for me now? <laughs> so, I guess I had I didn't know if that was a good sign or not I guess you know watching someone chop the head off a rat means you're ready to go work in a professional kitchen I didn't know what that meant at the time <laughs> it was you know just that lesson you needed it to have before lesson. you could work right. for them <laughs> yeah so I grew up in you know, working in the restaurant in high school and then of course when I was 18 my father told me it was in my blood I said nope I want a transfusion I don't want to do this so I joined the military and I was very fortunate to get on to um, get into a, 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 a department or a, a unit in the Air Force called pararescue. I tried out for a team, um, high washout rate. It's like a special operations uh, school, one of the more higher washout rates in the country. And uh, almost two years later, I, I, I made it through the training and I stood on, on stage and I got my uh, maroon beret. It's actually hanging in my office in a Shadow box. I, I, it's probably one of my most ch uh, cherished uh, possessions I have as my beret. Mm -hmm. I have, and and then after I got out of the military, I just went back into working in restaurants, and I decided I had a, a kind of a turning point when I was in my early twenties. Uh, I just decided that you know, I guess without my father over over me shadowing me or hounding me, however you want to put it, um, mm -hmm. I actually liked the restaurant business. So I just started working with the right chefs, working in the right you know right people, uh, learning as much as I could. Just became a sponge. Mm -hmm. Opened my first restaurant uh, at the age of 31, um, and then opened my second restaurant, sold those, and then I got recruited by a little-known chef out in California, Wolfgang Puck. Just Worked, a little one. <laughs> just a little-known little, little chef. <laughs> Worked for Wolf for like five years, and then I started my consulting company in 2005, and I've been doing restaurant consulting and coaching ever since. So That's amazing. A lot of stories, and that's where the book – yeah, the, that's where the book came from. A lot of stories. Okay, so let's dive deep a little bit into the story a little bit. So, like, who was some of your first mentors in the restaurant business? Because one of the things that we're always focusing on and telling people, especially you, uh, is finding people that you need a mentor. You need people yes. to help you educate yourself when, when you're trying to reach the next level. You always look for somebody that's done it, that has been there. So who were some of your mentors? Um, you know, of course, Wolfgang, I always say working for Wolfgang Puck was like getting a PhD in branding. I mean, everything you want to know about branding Wolfgang, I definitely gave me a lot of that stuff. But going back into my, uh, like my, my karate teacher, my martial arts instructor when I was in high school was a big, huge influence on me. As far as professional, I would say Chef Jay McCarthy. 
Hmm. Probably is probably one of my biggest. Um, he, he's actually mentioned in the end of the book in the acknowledgments. He's probably one of my biggest mentors. And the, the funny thing about Jay is, you know, how we always say it's not rocket science. You know, hmm. you know, cooking's not rocket science or running a restaurant's not rocket science. Well, Jay actually has a, a degree in aeronautical engineering. So he actually <laughs> is a rocket scientist. You know, that's too so, funny. Yeah. So it's kind of funny that he actually, when someone says, oh, it's not rocket science, he's like, it is to me. <laughs> You know, and uh, for a long time, I really focused on the creative st- side, like a lot of young chefs. I, cr- mm-hmm. you know, focused on that creative input. Uh, Jay really helped me kind of, uh, kind of take almost like an engineering approach to problems, mm-hmm. and and I use the word a lot now. I just I reverse engineer it. I see what's the problem, and then I break it down, and then I figure out what went wrong, and then I basically reverse it. And just like in goal setting, I know we talk, you know, we talk sometimes about goal setting. I reverse engineer. I find out what's my end target, my end goal. Now break it down and reverse it from the beginning and how do I need to get to that final result so Excellent. that that's how I, do. I look at a lot of my problems like that I, I basically just break them down and reverse engineer them so right? think, we're in this situation so yeah do you think you yeah. can solve any problem by reverse engineering everything I think I think you can solve most problems mm-hmm. yeah I would say 99.9 can okay. be you know broken down and reverse engineered um, cause whatever got you to the point, and this is, a, this goes back to my dad. My, my dad was one of those guys who had those great, great sayings, you know, that would stick with you for your lifetime. Mm-hmm. And one of my dad's one, he loved to quote all that quite often was the first thing you do when you find yourself in a hole is stop digging. <laughs> so I like that. Yeah. So first thing you do is you stop digging and I always find, and I always kind of elaborate on that. When you do find yourself in a hole, it's usually a hole you dug. So mm-hmm. you're down there. And the problem is when you are in a hole, you tend to look around right like this level and you just you see the same problem because you're in that you're in it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that that first position. You're in it. You're in the problem. and It's overwhelming. And you're just like, ah, oh. but I always tell people, if you, if you just stop, put the shovel down. If you look up, you might see there's someone with a hand reaching down to help you out of the hole, you know? <laughs> So, you know, if you just take a pause and I use, I I have, you know, certain trigger words that I use to help myself. And Mm -hmm. one of my trigger words is pause and process. So when I find myself in a situation, I just tell myself, take it, you know, stop for a second, take a breath. I always find taking a good clarifying deep breath in, breathe out Mm -hmm. through the mouth. And then I just say pause and process. All right. And then, all right. Let's look for some answers. Let's reverse engineers and look for some different answers. You know, and let's let's look for solutions, not problems. Yeah. It's so easy to throw out problems. You know, and other. You know, well, why are we in this situation? Oh, because this, you know, this and this, or so and so did this. We place the, you know, the blame and shame game. Mm-hmm. Oh, because so and so did this. No, no. I say I need solutions. I don't need. I don't need more problems. So. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I teach my clients to teach their staff mm-hmm. is don't come at me with problems. Come at me with solutions. And I would say. You're always, you're always, always at choice. Mm-hmm. Now, when somebody comes to me with two things, that's not choice. That's a dilemma. I can either do this or that. I mm-hmm. hate dilemmas. I like <laughs> choice. Choice is three. Sure. So I always tell people like, no, no, no. In, in the moment, you probably come up with two things, which is dilemma. I, I can either do this or I can do that. No, there's always a third option. Mm-hmm. There's always a third option. Yeah. If you really put your head to it and, and think about it and, again, pause and process, take a breath, detach from the situation – and usually you're, you know, you're unconscious. You know that the power of the unconscious mm-hmm. has so much information in there. Oh, absolutely. It can usually help you find the solution. Mm-hmm. So, Do you think that when clients of yours, well, probably not your clients, but when people, managers or owners that listen to this and they implement this into their business, do you think mm-hmm. that it can cause um, a culture clash? Because sometimes mm-hmm. when people... You know, managers could say, no, I don't want to hear about any of your problems because you don't have any solutions. Right. So right, right. how do you, what's the differentiating point of that? Yeah, well, the differentiating point is, again, putting the blame or putting the problem on someone else. Someone says we have a problem. Number one, I like to change the wordage. You know, mm-hmm. I don't have a problem. With, we have a challenge. We have, something to, we have something to discuss. And then also, too. Don't push it on someone. Hey, don't come to me. Oh, I don't want to hear about it until you, know, until you have three solutions. That's just pushing on someone else. Again, what you want to do is you want to be involved. And, and then I like to say is you want to be the kind of – you want to be the facilitator, mm-hmm. the problem facilitator. Okay, what is the challenge we have? All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, what are some uh, – What are some, let's, let's brainstorm. Let's get a piece of paper out. You know, let's brainstorm three options here. 
and it, you know, and, just, and I would just like everyone come up with some options. Let's go. All right, everyone, you know, put you know, contribute, contribute. That way, everyone owns own it, and mm-hmm. it's not just like me coming up with a solution. That's another thing. You don't want to be the solution, you know, or the problem solver for your team. Mm-hmm. You want them, you know, you might know the solution, but again, <clears throat> it's not about you coming up with the answers. It's about you helping people find the right solution, and helping them kind of clear their head and clear their, their pathways in there, you know, to come up with these things and be, pro- and, be and be more orientated to finding solutions. Mm-hmm. That's where the culture shift is. It's not because if we just go from, Oh, I have a problem. Oh, it's not my problem. You figure it out. You got to come up with three different solutions. That's just, that's just throwing the blame or throwing the monkey on someone else's back. Of course. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to shift the culture and shifting it. All right. What's our, what's our options here? Okay. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to dive a little deeper into the book now, because that just <laughs> launched in a few weeks ago. I mean, this is January. We're in 2018 already. Like three days ago, I think. <laughs> it's, it's launched like, yeah. Well, now we're in January. Yeah, yeah. we're in January. It launched like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, I mean, before we break down and go deeper into that, like, what do you think is the key factor that helped you translate when you went from pararescue in the United States Air Force? How does that, what were the lessons and strategies that you've learned there to help you build your brand as an entrepreneur? Well, the biggest thing I learned in pararescue was that a lot of times it wasn't, there was guys who tried out for pararescue. I mean, physically, these guys look like Olympic athletes. I mean, it's just like, I mean, buff. I mean, just, you know, physically just badasses. Mm -hmm. But those guys... You know, when it came down to it, you know, and you get these guys and I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, you know, we do a lot of pool training, a lot of water training. Uh, they call it water confidence mm-hmm. training. Now we used to just call it it's water harassment, <laughs> but you know, but water confidence training, you get these guys that, I mean, could run and do, you know, lift weights and do all this crazy stuff. Very, very physical. Mm-hmm. But when you get them in the pool, the mental side was the biggest thing. And I really found that, and, and I've seen this throughout the years. Restaurant success is really an 80-20 ratio. Mm-hmm. 20%, I always say, 20% is kind of systems and strategy. 80% is mindset. It's mm-hmm. the mindset. Because I can give someone, you know, I, mean, I can give you a checklist. Mm-hmm. I can give you tons of checklists. Yeah. But if you don't have the mindset to, you know, to understand how to apply them, how to use them, how to follow through, how to use your, you know, how to use that kind of the like, psychology, how to motivate your team to, to use the checklist, to apply the stuff, doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can give you all kinds of checklists. I can tell you, I can give you great strategies to build your brand. But in the end, if you don't have the, you know, the kind of self-discipline and stuff like that, you know, determination, self-discipline, um, goal setting skills, things like that, mental toughness, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really matter. And that's really where the book it really comes into. And it comes down to, and, and the title is kind of funny. And a lot of people read the title and they, I've already gotten in the... <laughs> <laughs> I've already gotten like you know emails from people. My restaurant sucks. How do you even know me? I'm like, don't judge a book by its cover. Right. Number one and number two, the you know if you read the book, you read the book. It's not about saying your restaurant sucks. Mm-hmm. It's basically saying don't accept mediocrity. If your restaurant or your life, and, and this book actually applies to both, because you know that life work balance thing is a bunch of BS. There's mm-hmm. no life work balance. There's just life. Mm-hmm. You know, and one of the things I, I talk about is, you know, if your restaurant or your life is not 100 percent the way you want it to be, then you just got to kind of admit it sucks. Hmm. You know, I like and that. I say and then in the military, we learned like, you know, things can suck and mm-hmm. life's going to throw curveballs at you all day long. And you can do two things. You can either sit there and go, oh, that's just the way it is. Or you can actually step up and say, all right, what am I going to do about it? Hmm. You know, and we call it just embrace the suck. That's why the book says, you know, embrace the suck, unleash your restaurant, and become outstanding. It's more in the mental game. This, this book is a definitely, and I tell people up front, if you're looking for checklists or recipes, you know, or, you know, things like that, this book isn't for you. Mm-hmm. This book is more about the mental game. Okay. Yeah. And the thing that I love most about your book is that it's broken down into sections. Mm-hmm. Like some books read from cover to cover the back page and it's just one long story but you I dive... started here <laughs> <laughs> you dive deep into menu design and like jedi mind tricks of menu design mm-hmm. and the culture and mindset and what do you think is the most important aspect of your book if somebody were to grab your book today 
where would be the best place to start? Uh, from probably mindset. Yeah, probably probably the mindset, and then after that, I would say teamwork and culture. Mm-hmm. Those are probably the big three things. You know, you, you probably get the same thing as me. I get people all the time. Oh, I need help marketing. I need to market more. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we can. I can. We can throw more money out there for marketing, and we can throw money at advertising. Mm-hmm. But if the culture's not right, people are going to come to your restaurant and have a bad experience, and then it doesn't really matter. It, I call it the hole in the bucket marketing theory. Mm-hmm. You know, people have these holes in their bucket, and they just think I'm going to throw more money at it, and then you know, just I'm going to fill the place with more people, which is fine. That's good. Hey, that's great. Fill the place. But if I, the more holes I have in my bucket, the more people leak through. And that also doesn't just include guests, but also includes my staff. If I have turnover and stuff like that, it's contributing to all the holes in my bucket. Mm-hmm. And I can, yeah, you can throw money at it all day, and you can keep that bucket filled up. Trust me, there are a lot of restaurants that have a lot of money and keep that bucket filled. Yeah, you know. So, what do you think is an aspect from when you look back at 2017 and the clients that you had? What do you think was missing? Um, from the the culture standpoint, that people should really be focusing in on in 2018. The biggest thing is looking at yourself. I mean, that's I'm, you hear me say it all the time. Culture flows down, doesn't flow up, and culture starts with you. The biggest thing is so easy, especially if you're an owner or manager, and you know, sit on top and look down at people, and you know, and they have to change. You know, oh, they need to change. No, no, no. You know, you need to change. You know, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. And the and the and the clients that I work with that really get that they make huge, huge changes mm-hmm. in their culture mm-hmm. because they make that shift when they understand that they're at cause. You know, the whole thing, cause or mm-hmm. effect. You know, Absolutely. you're either on the cause side or, or the effect side. When you understand that you are the cause, mm-hmm. and you know, and what you do and how you behave and your behavior and your attitude, your energy that you bring into your restaurant every single day has an effect on the culture. Culture is a living thing. It's an animal. It's it's really a living thing. And you feed it by what you bring. Mm-hmm. You know? For sure. It's that, it's that old, that old uh, what's that old story of the, the Indian grandfather talking to the son? You know, inside of me there's two wolves. Mm-hmm. One's, you know, desperate and lonely and sad and angry. And one's hopeful and happy and, and prosperous. You know, and they're, they're fighting each other. And he goes, oh, grandfather, which one's going to win? He goes, the one you feed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Same that. thing. Yeah. Same thing in your restaurant. It's the same for your culture. Whatever you feed your culture is what you're going to get. If you come in and you're just pissed off at the world and you come in and you're just like, you know, lit up to, you know, just to point out everything that's wrong in your restaurant. Trust me, you just setting a culture for everybody else in your restaurant. That's all we're going to focus on. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? If you're so driven on numbers and sales and you come in every day, what are we doing to get sales? What are we doing to drive the business? People are going to just be that focused like that. What are we doing to drive numbers? What are we doing? You know, cut, 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 save, save, save. What happens to the, what happens to the guest experience? It yeah. goes out the window. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you think that's a huge issue? Is Because a lot of the times you tell restaurants, I know from working or talking to you and working with you and mm-hmm. being on these podcasts and stuff that you always tell people to know their numbers. But mm-hmm. is there too much when somebody goes too far on the spectrum where they're so focused on just the numbers and throw out the culture piece that is that does that become an issue yes. yeah yes uh, because well here's my thing a lot of people don't know their numbers at all mm-hmm. so my first thing is that awareness precedes choice choice precedes change so if you don't know your numbers you don't even know where to make you know if you're just coming in oh we need to we need to raise the prices or we need to we need to jack we need to raise our prices on our menu well what's the menu costing you Oh, I don't know. Well, how can you how can you make an educated dis- you know dis- discussion or decision based on just a gut? Well, it served me this long. Okay, that might have worked back in the '80s when there was very few restaurants in your market, but it's 2007. You know, now it's 2018. Mm-hmm. You know, and things have changed. The rules have changed. The game has changed. The market has changed. Mm-hmm. Customers have changed. Guest perceptions have changed. Guest, you know, guest expectations have changed. If you don't make adapt, you know, adapt and adjust to the market, you mm-hmm. soon find yourself. And I mentioned in the book like Howard Johnson. Remember Howard Johnson's Hojo's? Mm-hmm. Yeah, back in the I think the late seventies, there was like one thousand forty of them. Now, what? And I think that guy's in trouble. I think he has a sexual harassment suit against him. It might know. not be by the time. <laughs> 
Oh my, hold your breath on that one. That might not be an accurate. It might be none pretty soon in 2018. Yeah. There's one clinging on to life. That's too bad. I mean, yeah. we'll come up to that topic later on today, I'm sure. But I want to <laughs> talk about um, when it comes to the the mindset, because we're still, we need to focus on mindset as entrepreneurs, as employees, no matter what it is. Like if you're an entrepreneur and you have your restaurant, like what is it that the mindset that you want your employees to have coming in? And that's where the culture piece comes in. But yes. to the, how can restaurant owners or operators or managers shift their mindset as we start going into 2018? Like this is fresh January, like the second week in yeah. January, we're fresh. How can we shift our mindset to improve things today? Well, the first thing I would say is you want to drop, you know, first thing every time I, I go into a new year, I always tell all my clients, we always work on an exercise. It's like a strategic planning kind of thing. And the first thing we do is I say, what do we want to leave behind? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what, you know, we all have baggage, you know, everyone has baggage. I don't care who you are. Everybody has baggage. Here's my rule. Everyone has bags. What you want to do is you want to kind of adopt the airline philosophy. It's got to fit in the overhead compartment or the seat underneath you. So we just basically want to downsize our bags. That's mm -hmm. all. So the first thing I want to do everybody to do is I want them to get clear, you know, clarity and drop your bags. What do you want to leave behind from last year? What things, what kind of attitudes, perceptions, beliefs that you held to that are no longer serving you that we need to drop at the door and just leave them for someone else to pick up? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's it. the first thing. Yeah, drop those bags. And the second thing, you want to get a clear map where you are. And just like in, in pararescue, when they dropped us, you know, and I would, you know, do a, you know, parachute into a to a place you know the first thing we did when we hit the ground because i'm telling you where they tell you they're going to drop you off at and where you actually are are always two different places <laughs> and, you know it, it's like we're like miles away from where they told us you know <sighs> you know so you, first thing you do you break out your map mm -hmm. and a map is basically for 2018 your map is where you know look at your map and you want to look at where you are now you want to plot where i'm at now and then you want to plot where i want to be by December 31st, 2018. And then I look at that distance, and that's what I call that's what we call the gap. And then what we want to do is again, I want to reverse engineer it and I want to make a plan. How do I get from point A to point B? Mm. Knowing that along that trail, <laughs> there's gonna be some obstacles. Because yeah. nothing's ever when you get dropped off in the in the real world out in the woods and you make, oh, I'm gonna go there. Perfect, let's go. And we're hiking along and also we're walking up and we also hmm, a three thousand foot crevice. Nice. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, what are our options? Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at our options. We can rappel down. That might take some time. Oh, all right, well, actually, looking at the thing, uh, we can actually navigate around with a mile out of our way. There's a, you know, there's a little thing we can get through. We can go around it. You know, there's always different options, but you always want to look at it, you know? Yeah. So then I make, you know, when obstacles come up, what's my plan? What's my thing to keep going? What's my trigger? I, I use triggers to keep myself kind of going throughout the year because throughout the year here's a here's i think it's a sad statistic did you know only eight percent of people achieve their new year's goals oh it's that little yeah eight percent eight percent but in the in the other sad thing is like 80 percent will drop their goals by january 15th oh so <laughs> those, those goals uh, those goals they make you know mm -hmm. on january 1st by the 15th of january 80% of people have already dropped it. You know, like, oh, I just can't do it. Oh, it's too much. And then throughout by January, by December 31st, 2018, only 8% of everyone who makes goals will actually reach their goals. Wow. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is basically a lot of them are unrealistic. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, you got a small, you know, 40-seat restaurant, and, you know, oh, this is my year. 2018 is going to rock. I have 40 seats. And we're going to do $3 million in sales. Okay. That might be a little unrealistic for 40 <laughs> seats. You know, Just are you going to do takeout? No. Okay. Are you in delivery? No. But we're going to do $3 million just in the restaurant. Okay. That's maybe a little unrealistic based on this, the, just the number of seats you have mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> they underestimate how long it's going to take also. They always like, it's like people going to the gym. Sign up on January 1st. They're working out that first week. By the second week, they're not like Olympic athletes yet. And they're like, oh, this is more work than I thought. 
this is going to take me longer than I thought. I'm not going to be able to accomplish this in just two weeks or a month or two months or three months. This is going to be a long-term commitment. Yes. So, you know, and then they also, they have more of those I should goals Mm -hmm. instead of I want, you know, I should lose some weight. It's like smoking when people want to smoke. A lot of times, you you probably didn't know, but I do hypnotherapy too, right? Nice. And I used to have people come to me and say, oh, I'd like to learn how, I'd like to stop smoking. Oh, well, why do you want to stop smoking? Oh, my wife's on my case, you know, she says I should stop smoking. Well, do you really want to stop smoking? No, not really, but, you know, if it makes her happy and gets her off my back, then I'll do it. Well, that's not really going to work because it's not your, you know, it's not your goal. It's someone else's goal, basically. (laughs) You know, and you just want to do it because you think it'd be nice. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, nice twos. The thing when you're setting your goals for the year is definitely you want to have, these are things I must accomplish. Mm -hmm. You know, I must make this happen. And it's not an option. It, again, this is this, this is one of those things where there is no option. Mm-hmm. Easy is not an option. Failure is not an option. I make the goal. And turn it into a priority. I turn it into a priority. And then as things come up, and that's another thing. There's no, A lot of people don't have a review process or adjustment. Mm-hmm. You know, we I, I love that kind of thing, uh, saying uh, if, if it's not working, try something else. If that's not working, try something else. If that's not working, try something else. If that's not working, try something else. <laughs> <You know? laughs> What's next? <laughs> if that doesn't work, try something else. If that doesn't work, try something else. But you keep going until you get the result you want. Mm-hmm. Okay. If your goal is very clear and very specific and you know exactly what you want and you can see it, picture it, feel it, touch it, and embody it and, and put yourself into that position, then you can make it happen if you just, you just keep taking action, action, action. Yeah, right. And then also too, is uh, again setting setting the uh, goals for yourself in the in a negative tone, mm-hmm. instead of in a positive. I am, ex- you know, I am, uh, I am enjoying. It's December thirty first, two thousand eighteen, and I am enjoying reaching our sales goal of one point five million dollars this year. Hmm. You know, absolutely. Yeah, clear, clear. And as a as a reward for hitting my goal. I'm going to, you know, for Christmas, I'm, for Christmas of 2018, I'm going to buy the staff this. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to take my wife for a weekend down in San Diego. Mm-hmm. We're going to stay at the Coronado, you know, the really nice, fancy, you know, hotel. But you have stuff there and have rewards for yourself. So it's not just a goal. You know, how empty is that? I want to reach, <clears throat> I want to hit $1.5 million for my restaurant. Ooh. Doesn't it? It motivates the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Do I can tell. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what's going to happen? Well, how will your life change? That's what I, I really want people to write. How will your life change when you hit this goal? How will things change for you when you hit this? How will you be? What kind of person will you be? Mm-hmm. Now, when you start putting those kind of details into it, now the goal starts taking on some life. Now you can start feeling it. Yeah, if I hit one point five, you know, for a small restaurant, that's going to change my life. I can really, I can do a lot more, you know, for my family, for my community. Well, what would you do? Oh, you know, I can, I could actually start maybe donating to you know that little that, uh, elementary school around the corner from my restaurant, and I can start donating to their after school program and helping fund some meals for kids that are disadvantaged. Hey, that's awesome. How's that make you feel? Makes me feel great. Makes me feel like I'm I'm contributing back. Now we're talking. Now you got a now you got something that's not just such a goal. Now you got a vision for your year, and that's where people need. Absolutely. That's what's going to set you on fire. That's what's going to make you wake up and have that Mm -hmm. purpose every single day. And then having those little trigger words throughout the year, having stuff set up around you that keeps you motivated, like my my wristband. These are my my restaurant coach wristbands. Mm -hmm. But the word on there is what's next. Mm -hmm. And all my clients get that. You know, it's like it just every time you look at it, it's like, what's next? All right. Mm -hmm. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. In my office, I have my little reminder about. um, You are here. <laughs> I want to be there. What do I need to do? Right. I have this timer that you gave me. Oh, hey. Your, I like that circle. one. Inner but circle it just reminds club. me that, you know, whenever I work on a project, like write a book or anything, that's the thing that I turn it over and I'm like, okay, this is the amount of time that I have for this. I'm going to laser mm-hmm. focus on it and then I'm going to move on to the next thing. That's another thing. Yes. It's, I, one of my things I do with my clients is scheduling focus blocks, mm. you know, 30 minute focus blocks and that timer. actually, I have mine's over on the other side. It's on top of my computer. <laughs> love it. I love but it. I love focus blocks. Focus blocks. 
because that's another thing we make again unrealistic. Oh, you know, I'm gonna write a book. All right, that's great. That's a big. That's yeah, a big, you, know, <laughs> you know. I call it. I call it the cow. You know, the <laughs> that's like the cow, and you know, people always have that. That joke. What's that joke? You know, could you eat a whole cow? People say no. You know, yeah, you can. One steak at a time. <laughs> You just got to cut that sucker into steaks, mm -hmm. you know? Amen. But when you're looking at that big, huge thing, I'm going to write a book. That's, I mean, I was the same way. It was like, this is my year. I'm going to write a book. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down, I'm like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> looking at the blank computer screen, that's a lot of nothing, uh -huh. you know? And it's funny, like, my, you know, the editor, the editor who worked on my book, uh, who worked on your book, mm -hmm. He cut down. I I went well once I got into flow and mm -hmm. got going. I started scheduling blocks. I, you know, I started making a commitment to writing like three times a week and putting stuff in there three times a week. It actually got to the point. The book now is only well only it's <laughs> two hundred and seventy six pages. It was three hundred and sixty five pages. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. That's a big book. It was a lot of book, and he really helped whittle it down. And I'm happy he did because. Yeah. That would have been crazy. <laughs> I, it, I didn't set out to write War and Peace. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the restaurant, restaurant version. The restaurant version, you know, a novel like this, take you six months to read. I wanted something mm -hmm. that could be digestible. Of and that's course. another reason why we broke it down into little segments, too. Whatever your focus is, because I think those the key chapters in there, culture, mindset, menu, marketing, teamwork, you know, those things are all usually challenges I get presented with or asked about. Those are usually the the key mm. kind of challenges most restaurant owners have. Okay. So I broke it down where you could just pop the book open. You don't have to read front to back. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no chronological order. If you missed, you know, chapter through, you know, 4.3, you're not going to be like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, that, I made it where it could just be, I could open it up and get some solutions. Of course. Yeah. Excellent. So let's talk about some marketing really quick. What do you think restaurants have to do in 2018? to really set the restaurant on fire be consistent that's the biggest thing is so many restaurants dabble they dabble in marketing they dabble in social media you know they don't have a consistent plan and here's and i always tell people when i say you should market more a lot of restaurants automatically like, oh, i just don't have time for that and then i usually pause and i say did i ever said did i ever say in the statement you need to market more did i ever say you need to market more no I said, you just need to market more. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get other people to do that for you. <laughs> it doesn't have to. A lot of people, every time I tell people to do stuff, they always, I think they always assume I mean they have to do it. No, mm -hmm. I don't mean you have to do it. I mean you have to have someone on your team do it or outsource it to someone to do it. Mm -hmm. It's that easy. And social media marketing is very, very cost effective. Oh, absolutely. I mean, compared to billboards, oh, I mean... <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, we, we we both know like Bruce Serving. Bruce Serving is a brilliant, uh, you know, restaurant marketing mm -hmm. expert. Um, he has actually a company that does a lot of that mark that advertising for you and stuff like that. We, we, you know, there's tons of people out there that can help you. You don't Excellent. have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. For sure. But the thing is, you got to be consistent about it, and you got to make a plan, mm -hmm. and you got to implement, and you got to take action, and you got to do it every day. <laughs> just in the marketing, though, do you have to stay consistent in just the marketing, or like, how consistent do you have to be? Okay, um, for marketing, I think you got to have a pretty you got you got to create a plan. Now, depending on your brand, mm -hmm. you know, some brands like to you know, like the big brands like McDonald's and Wendy's and stuff like that. And they're every day they're probably like flooding Twitter with stuff all day. But they also have someone hired that pretty much stands and watches your Twitter feed or stuff like that and responds to stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now you probably don't have that in your budget yet. That's okay. That's a goal. All right. But here's the thing: be interactive. Engage mm -hmm. with people. When people make a comment on your stuff, say thank you. You know, engage with them. A lot of people just wait for the bad stuff to happen when they get a bad review and then they go into action. No, no, no. Respond to everything. And it doesn't have to be like this whole huge, thank you so much for coming to my restaurant. You don't know how much that means to me. I so much appreciate you coming in tonight. We were so slow and then you came in and then you turned it around because we didn't have any customers. Now we had a customer and you were so happy and I was just so happy you were happy. No, you don't have to go into that. You just got to go. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. You know, I really appreciate you. you know, of course. The most two powerful words in the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That goes beyond marketing. That goes to everybody. Everybody in your life, everybody on your team. For sure. You know, walking around just being appreciative. Attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And that's so, so needed in this industry when 
you know, oh. we're in the weeds and we're 20 tickets deep and we're 45 minutes behind on everything and the chef's yelling or the manager's like, oh, I rang something in. The servers come running in. I rang something in, but it didn't get made and there, there's no ticket for it. What's going on? You know, and instead of they're so panicked and on the what's happening then that they don't focus on the attitude of gratitude throughout the shift. Yeah. And that goes to culture again. Mm -hmm. So perception is projection. You've heard that saying. Yep. Right. Mm hmm. So if I'm the if I'm the owner or manager or chef and I'm panicking, what do you think my team's gonna be doing? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I set the tone. My energy again, culture flows down, doesn't flow up. If I'm panicking, I send a subliminal message to everyone on my team. You need to be panicking. Mm -hmm. You need to run around <laughs> like chicken with your head cut off. Everyone panic because I'm panicking. Everyone freak mm -hmm. out because I'm freaking out. You stay calm during the, you know, that's the thing. And that's, I, I would have probably say that was probably the biggest thing in pararescue that taught us is that the guys who panicked, you know, during <clears throat> water confidence training, mm -hmm. the guys who panicked didn't make it. And I don't care how big and bad they were, but you, if you couldn't keep a calm head, you know, and I use the example in the book, buddy breathing. So buddy breathing, you're standing there and you got, you got your arms locked up with another guy and you're in the pool and you got a mask on, and you got one snorkel mm -hmm. and you take a breath, you hold it and you pass it over to the, your buddy and, you know, he takes a breath and you pass it back and forth. That itself is kind of a challenging because, you know, of course, I don't have the snorkel. He has a snorkel now. What if he doesn't pass it back? I'm thinking all these things. What if he doesn't like me? What if, I, <laughs> what if the other day I, like, butt, you, know, I ch you know, I jumped in front of him a line at chow. Now he's mad. Now he's not going to pass the snorkel back. I'm not going to have any air. I'm going to say here, oh, it's going to be embarrassing, right? I mean, that by itself is bad, right? Because yeah. you have all these like things about yourself, mm -hmm. your self-perception. Oh, what if I did? What do I do? What, what if he doesn't think I deserve the, 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 the snorkel back? Oh, mm -hmm. my God. What am I going to do? <laughs> That's bad enough. But then you have instructors that are circling around you like sharks, and like they're splashing the water you know, you know, or pulling your mask off or tipping it up where it fills up with water and you can't see now. Mm -hmm. you know, or you're just getting ready to take that that breath and they put their hand on top of the snorkel and then oh, oh no air okay but i still gotta pass the snorkel back so you have to pass it to your buddy because you can't hog it you can't yeah. you know this isn't like this isn't like a college party where oh, this is mine it's mine it's not yours i can't nobody gets no air <laughs> i mean you gotta pass it back absolutely so, you know so you get into this thing and uh you, you know the guys the people who panic it's an automatic fail you're you're out mm-hmm Gotta stay calm. That's the biggest thing. Culture flows down, doesn't flow up. If you're panicking, if you're in the words you use too as an owner, a manager, or a leader in your organization, that's another one. I hate the word manager. Oh, I hate it. I hate that word. I hate I like leader. But yeah. a lot of people use the word manager. But if we say we're in the weeds, okay. There's a certain <laughs> there's a certain kind of uh, perception about being in the weeds. Mm -hmm. When you say to the team, Oh, we're in the weeds. All right, we're in the weeds. Everyone panic. We're in the weeds. <laughs> Where is the weed? I don't even see. When I'm in a kid, I don't see no weeds. I don't see anything. Like, who decided that you're in the weeds? Mm -hmm. One person decided that it was in the weeds time, and now everyone's in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Everyone's panicking. So and every, productivity every time I, drops. Productivity drops. But that's, that's the thing about being a real leader is, like, noticing that and saying, hey, hey, hey. Everything's great. All right, we got this. Yeah. Okay. Everyone, take a breath. And I've actually stopped lines in the middle of service. Stop lines. Everybody, stop. All right. Everybody, look at me. Look at me. And then I'll say, everyone, take a deep breath into your nose. Breathe out through your mouth. Everything's fine. Okay. We're good. All right. One ticket at a time, man. Let's just go. And then everybody, okay. And then everybody calms back down. Everybody gets back into rhythm, you know. Okay. It takes a couple minutes to get back into rhythm, mm -hmm. but I've yeah, I've actually like stopped <laughs> lines in the middle of like you know the rush and all right, eh, time out. <laughs> so anyone that had ordered well done steaks was totally fine then. They were fine. They were fine. <laughs> it doesn't take that long. It only takes like about ten seconds to get everybody's <laughs> attention real quick. Sure. You know. Perfect. Well, let's so. You mentioned earlier in the show that there is no work-life balance. There's just yeah. life. But I like to... The reason why I titled this podcast Beyond the Restaurant is because we have lives outside the restaurant. They're, yeah, yeah. They're, you know, going beyond the restaurant is... The restaurant is your business. The restaurant is the thing mm -hmm. that sustains you. But right. there's life outside of that. So how would you 
talk to somebody or how would you explain work life balance to somebody that's like all I ever do is work in the restaurant 24/7 yeah. and that's an indicator yep. they're working in the restaurant 24/7 yeah. um but like how do you talk to them about that well again there's no life work balance to me it's life mm-hmm. but here's the thing your life needs to have different aspects to be fulfilled mm-hmm. you just can't have all work if you're working 80 90 hours a week and I always love those you know, when I go in and do a consultation. So, you know, t- tell me your typical work. Oh, I mean, I'm, where, I'm here all the time. I'm here 24-7. Like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing like 90 hours a week. And my first thing, why? <laughs> well, and then, of course, I get a whole bunch of excuses. And usually it comes down to trust. They don't trust anybody else to do their job at them, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, no one else can do it. Well, have you taught them? <laughs> have you uh, trained them? Have you talked to them about it? Have you offered responsibility to step up? Oh, yeah, I did, but then they just dropped the ball. And so they just take it back. Hmm. All right, well, I'm sure, and I, I usually put this in terms, they can say, so your parents, right? You can walk, right? Yeah, why? Well, your parents didn't say, you know, when you first started walking and you, and you got up and you took a couple steps and you fell down, that's it. He can't do it. That's it. He's not a walker. I, you know what? Just put him in a put him in a, put him in a stroller. He's going to be a stroller kid the rest of his life. He can't do it. He just can't. He's mm. not a walker. He tried. Can't do it. Let's take it back from him. We'll we'll control him. We'll push him around for the rest of his life. Is that how <laughs> your parents did you? And then they're usually like, usually they give you that blank look, like, uh, <laughs> no. And then exactly. So why do you expect the same things from your from your staff? If you don't give them a chance to fall and pick themselves up, they're never going to learn to walk. Sure. So you got to let them, you got to let them. And sometimes I'm telling you, sometimes when you're a kid and it's an ugly spill, it's a face plant, you mm-hmm. know, especially if you were not lucky to have parents who had carpeting and you had hardwood floors. I mean, mm-hmm. it was a bam, it was a face plant. Crying. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Luckily, see, that's why your teeth don't really grow mm-hmm. until you're older. I think that's the reason why, because you'd have like no teeth because <laughs> you just face plant and yeah. you have no teeth. For that's sure. why you're not born with a full mouth of teeth because Nature understands, evolution understands that you're going to have some mistakes. Let's not mm-hmm. put some teeth in there yet because he's going to fall. And if we put teeth in too soon, he's going to knock them all out and then it's going to look really bad. You know, nothing worse than nothing worse when a six year old with dental with dentures. You know, right. that's, that's terrible. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> you're at school, you're, you're in kindergarten, you're having your lunch, you got to take your dentures out to have your milk, you know, and your, and your cheese stick. You know, no, that's not good. <laughs> So the thing is, is finding a life that is fulfilled. And mm-hmm. I always, I always encourage finding things outside the restaurant. And a part of the big thing, I'm always a big in- indicator of, and this goes back to culture and taking care of yourself is self-care. Mm-hmm. Self-care involves, <laughs> exactly what it means, taking care of yourself. That means getting out, getting some air, getting some exercise, going to, going to, you know, concerts, going to movies, going to dinner at other places. I love when I say when I ask people, "What was the last restaurant you ate at besides your own?" And they're like, "What? You mean there's other restaurants out there? Yes, there are other <laughs> in your market. I know you don't think so, but there are other restaurants in your market. You should get out and try it. You know, but having life is not about all work. Life is about having pretty much having everything, having everything you want. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where it really is. And I say there's no life work balance because there is just life." But you have to look at it and look at it as what are some other things. Now, there's some days where, yeah, I put extra hours in my work. Mm-hmm. And there's some days I, I take a little bit more time off and I and I go hang out with my girlfriend and we go take a you know a day, you know, trip down to Tucson and we hang out in the sun in the pool and I turn my phone off for a couple days. Mm-hmm. But that's that's life. That's about finding that kind of you know inner peace. Mm-hmm. For sure. You know, I hate trying to say balance because then everyone thinks balance they, they think is like a scale. And yeah. if it's like, you know, I have to have 50, 50, I'm only working. Well, I can, I can only work 40 hours this week cause I have to have life balance. Hmm. So I think when we use that perception of life balance, we think of it as a scale. Yeah. I think of it more as life has to be kind of encompassing and fulfilling mm-hmm. and you have to find your own kind of recipe <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know, for what fits you. Some mm-hmm. people like a little, some people like a little bit more work in their life. For sure. It doesn't mean it has to. It, when it over, when it over, when it dominates you, it controls you, and you can't step away from it. Then it's something to talk about. Mm-hmm. Which 
leads into my next question is the overarching reason and the question why I wanted to start this show was Mm -hmm. the question, what do I have to do to succeed in this business without it consuming me? So what are like two, three strategies that restaurant owners or chefs that are opening the restaurants can take right now to set themselves up for success so they are not plugged into the restaurant 24 7 develop yourself develop your train your team that means train okay train 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 and train some more and then trust you gotta have that you gotta develop yourself and you gotta be confident right in your own stuff i think a lot of people overcompensate if you're not confident about your stuff, your skills and, and, and your abilities, you throw we tend to throw more work at it. That mm-hmm. was as usually is a solution. Uh, you know, I just I just got to work harder. And that's not necessarily the answer. Working harder is not you know, being effect, being busy and being effective are two different things. Mm-hmm. You know, very, very different. I know a lot of people you, you I can be I can be busy all day doing nothing sometimes, you know, <laughs> I can be. <laughs> Busy all day, mm-hmm. you know, checking, you know, doing this, doing that, and then the whole day's gone. I'm like, oh, it's dark. What happened? I didn't really, you know. And even me, even myself, I, I have days sometimes where I'm like looking at myself and I'm like, uh oh, all right, I got drawn into distraction, mm-hmm. you know, the dimension of distraction. But the biggest thing is to, to understand that, forgive yourself, don't beat yourself up for it, you know, and then get back on track. Mm-hmm. But developing yourself is number one, so that way you have the confidence. Because when you're confident, you have a totally different attitude when you walk into your restaurant. Mm-hmm. And I, there's a difference between confidence and cocky. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> confidence is silent. Mm-hmm. It's backed up with kind of just it's just a, it's more of a feeling. I got this. I understand this. I can do this. I can handle this. Mm-hmm. Where cocky is more, you know, yeah, you don't know. You know, this is my place, and you know, you're gonna do it my way. And, and there's a lot of cocky out there. It's very mm-hmm. few, there's very little confidence. And then also, you know, training your team, your team, making going from a training culture to a learning culture is probably the biggest shift you can do. Most restaurants have a training culture We you do the onboarding. Hey, Andrew, you're new here. Here. Hey, uh, see that guy, Joe? Yeah, follow Joe around for three days. Do what he does. Say what he says. And then uh, I'll check in with you. OK, thanks. Bye. You know, and then you turn them over to somebody and it's tribal. It's very, you know, knowledge, you know, you know, just and it depends on what kind of training you get. It depends on what kind of mood Joe's in that day. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's like sure. Joe's in a bad mood. You don't get that good training. Mm-hmm. Hey, just stay out of my way. Just watch. You know, just, oh, go peel some go peel some carrots. Well, I'm supposed to learn pizza station day. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. So just peel some carrots and I'll get with you later. And then, you know, now the now your new employees kind of, you know, like, uh, I came here to learn to do this and this. And now they got me peeling carrots, you know, mm-hmm. which I don't mind. But, man, is this it? Is this my, is this my is this my life now? And then they start. And then all hell ask you, is this it? This is what I signed up for. Is this how it's going to be the rest of the day? Am I just going to come in here every day and peel carrots? I don't need this. You know, I can go down the street and get fourteen dollars an hour and don't have to peel carrots. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine like these little voices in your head bouncing mm. around. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then the third thing you got to have after you train, 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 and, and get from that training culture to a learning culture. And then the third thing is you got to trust. You got to trust yourself. You got to trust your team and understand that they are like that little kid walking. They're going to fall. They're going to make mistakes. Hey, it's okay. Let's talk about it. Let's make some course corrections. Let's make some adjustments and let's pick ourselves up and let's move on. Love it. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up too bad. Mm -hmm. You're human. That's the one thing I love about uh, restaurants is I think we forget sometimes that we're human Mm -hmm. and we are fallible and we do make mistakes. For sure. It's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, learn learn from your mistakes is okay. Now, if you keep pe- repeating the same mistake over and over, now we have a learning problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to say, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's all right. That's what they have people like you and me for, right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we. Still... I don't know. <laughs> the best thing about coaching is you just like you. It's almost like you're a psychiatrist. You're like, why do you feel that way? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Interesting. Why do you feel that way? Yeah, I love it. Um, so that's amazing. If if our listeners want to learn more about what you do <laughs> and learn more from you, because right now you have this amazing <clears throat> online program platform called the Restaurant Coach University. So can you tell yes. us a little more about that? Because that's something <clears throat> that's amazing and it's incredibly affordable for every restaurant owner out there. Yes, so it just it's just launching in you know in 2018 just launched in 2018. I revamped it all. Mm-hmm. And so it's at the restaurantcoach.com. 
when you go there, you'll see um, you'll see a button that can give you more information about it. I'm one of those people like, you know, if you want to learn, I'm not going to shove it down your throat. If you want to learn, you want to take your life to the next level and you want to improve yourself. And that's, again, that's creating a learning culture, not a training culture. If you want to create a learning culture, the Restaurant Coach University inside the restaurantcoach.com is designed for you. There's online courses. And I, again, it's not a bunch of checklists. There's websites out there that will give you tons of checklists, you know, for a monthly subscription. Mm-hmm. They will sign you up. They will give you che- every checklist you probably ever wanted in, your, in the world. And that's great. My thing is, again, I focus more on the mindset. Mm-hmm. How to change your mindset to change you, to change your culture, which will have a long-lasting impact on the success of your restaurant. That's my focus. Mm-hmm. And so there's courses in there and stuff like that. The Inner Circle Club is probably the, one of the most affordable ones out there for all the online courses. Um, it's it's 97 a month. It's it's a it's a really great deal. There's nine. I think I have there's nine courses currently, and I'm adding one new course or workshop every month. Wow. So that's that's my 2018 goal. So mm-hmm. by the end of the year, there's gonna be a lot of workshops on there, <laughs> and we're also we also do monthly webinars, and there's also some insight, um, some inside kind of exclusive material. You know, I do a lot of blog writing like you. Mm-hmm. I write for Foodable TV, I write for Toast, and also I write for my own blog. But in the Inner Circle Club, you get stuff that's kind of like my. It's like it's like I call it, it's the good stuff. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's the secret stuff. You know, the ninja stuff. stuff. It's the ninja stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's the stuff that you don't want. Let's put it this way. It's the stuff you don't want your competition to know. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff you want to keep private to yourself. You don't want the other people in your market to know. Yeah. But yeah, the Inner Circle Club. And then so there's three different programs. The Inner Circle Club is basically access to all the programs. Great way to start. And if you really decide you really want to take it to the next level and you really want to get into coaching, and do like team coaching, like, and then 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 my program would be the Summit Club, mm-hmm. and the Summit Club involves it's more of a team program, and I usually I call it I call it the trifecta or the trinity. Mm-hmm. It involves usually the owner, the the general manager, and the chef. And here's my thing: it's called the trinity for a reason. Mm-hmm. You need all three people need to be enrolled in the coaching. I love people who call me and go. Yeah, I'd like to get some restaurant coaching. Yeah, sure. Who, who's like, who, you know, is, is this for you, right? And uh, for your team? Oh, no, 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 not for me. It, it's for my, it's for my general manager. He needs it. All right. Do you, are you actively involved in your restaurant? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm there all the time. So, um, and, and do you have a chef? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the chef's fine. It's just the general manager. He's the one I have problems with. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, it's. Restaurant coaching works, and I always tell people, usually uh, the people who contact me, probably one out of 20 actually will will be actually qualified mm. for the coaching program because most people don't want to commit to j- jumping in and talking about their shit. <laughs> you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? For sure. You know? Mm-hmm. You know? 100%. And yeah. you can't make it work without every piece of the puzzle coming together. Right. And then my third program is for, usually this is, it's, this is private coaching mm-hmm. where I always say, Inner Circle Clubs about learning, creating a learning culture, a lot of online workshops, stuff like that. The Summit Clubs about team coaching. Mm. And then the peak, my peak private coaching program is for individuals. It's one on one. And in that program, we're gonna talk very we'll talk about your restaurant, but most of the time we're gonna focus on you and we're gonna we're gonna like, you know, talk about baggage. Yeah, we're gonna open up the bags. Mm. I'm gonna be like the TSA at the airport giving you that search. We're gonna open the bags up. We're going to dig through them. I'm going to do a scanner on everything. I'm going to dig through the bags. We're going to pull. I'm like, what is this? What the hell you need that for? I'm throwing it away. You know, that's <laughs> it. I'm going to be like TSA at the airport <laughs> with the peak private coaching. It's going to get, it's going to, we're going to go to some places you don't want to go. We're going to go there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to get, and then the really cool thing about the peak private coaching is every quarter we kind of meet, I get you out of your element. So mm-hmm. I'm going to take you out of your restaurant. We're going to go to some different city. We're going to hang out. We're going to do some fun stuff. Like we might go to San Diego and go, uh, you know, cage diving with some sharks. Mm -hmm. You know, I might take you up to San Francisco and throw you off a bridge and a bungee jump. Who knows? (laughs) I'm crazy like that. (laughs) No. Don't worry. I'll have a bungee attached to you. It's not like I'm going to throw you off the bridge. I'm going to have a bungee attached to you. (laughs) I'll go with you. I'll jump with you. Love it. Yeah. We can go skydiving if you want. Mm Mm-hmm. Whatever you want, but I'm gonna get you out of your comfort zone. I'm gonna I'm gonna push you to that 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 point where you just basically you're unstoppable. Love it. 
That's amazing. Three different programs. Mm -hmm. Three different ways you can get results. Get and get the results. Not just talk about it, not just dream about it, but actually you'll actually get results. So for the listeners that are ready to dive on in, where can they find you? Oh, the restaurantcoach.com. It's pretty easy, huh? <laughs> Donald Burns is a restaurant coach at the restaurantcoach.com. Love it. And on social media, what are you? What are your I'm links? Donald Burns. Donald Burns on Twitter, Donald Burns on Instagram, Donald Burns on LinkedIn. On Facebook, all right. Mm -hmm. Facebook, someone took the restaurant, you know, took restaurant coach. So uh, on Facebook, my uh, Facebook page is The Real Restaurant Coach. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Someone took Restaurant Coach. I could, they're not even a restaurant coach. What? They, I know. They just like they took it, though. So I was like, I didn't jump on that one. I was lucky. I was an early adopter. I jumped on Twitter and Instagram, and I got Donald Burns right away. Nice. Yeah. See, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to do these cool things. Then when I was like, I'm branding myself, then now everything was taken. I'm like, Arr. now everything's taken. Yeah, yeah. Everything's different now. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is, is that you, you know, you always think like you're the only Donald Burns. I always think I'm a, there's Donald Burns. I'm Donald Burns. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I went originally, my old website was donaldburns.net mm -hmm. Cause I went to go get donaldburns.com And there was a, a, a gentleman in Florida. He's a resume writer who has yeah. donaldburns.com now, but he's an older gentleman. So, mm. It might become tick, available. Tick, tick. <laughs> just have this thing. Just, just, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just turning that hourglass upside down and waiting him out. That's okay. I did get I, I did get the restaurantcoach.com and that's that's you know because my brand is the restaurant coach. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say, oh, so you're a restaurant coach? I always say, no, I'm the restaurant coach. <laughs> There's a difference. The one and only. <laughs> yeah. You're you're a trainer? No, I'm the trainer, right? That's good, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. The Andrew Carlson, you need. The, the, the hospitality trainer, mm -hmm. the customer service trainer. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Donald. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the so show today. This has been amazing. I'm sure everyone listening to this episode has just brought home tons of amazing nuggets and stuff that they can implement into the restaurant. I can't <laughs> tell you how amazing it was that you took the time for this interview i can't i ranted i ranted let's put it that way i went <laughs> off but there's going to be plenty of actionable <laughs> items that we can use into our own restaurants and i love it it's so amazing and so thank you for everything thanks for coming on the show oh no thank you i'm a huge fan of your book by the way customer service the bottom line i make it required reading for all my clients because oh, it's a it's an incredible book thank you so incredible much. book yeah that, that one was a tough book to write just because I'd never written a book before. And I, try, you know, I was just so focused on writing yeah. the book. I didn't, you know, take it one steak at a time like you should. There you go. <laughs> I'm looking at that cow going. Yeah. Which end do I start at, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's still alive. Oh, that's a problem, too. What do I do now? Exactly. <laughs> no. <laughs> and for the people that want to get your book, Your Restaurant Sucks, uh, where can they find it? On Amazon. Amazon.com. Just check. Uh, just type in Donald Burns. Uh, my book will pop up. Or if you put in your restaurant sucks exclamation point. Mm. I don't know why, but you have to put in your restaurant sucks exclamation point, and then you'll find it there too. Interesting. So yeah, and then here's the thing: the Kindle version's available mm -hmm. on Amazon. Here's another sweet little kind of perk: if you sign up for the Inner Circle Club or any of my other uh, online programs, you get a hard copy. A full color hard copy edition of the book. Is it signed? Yes. Oh, nice. Yes. So. So run. Run. run so again. if you yeah, and, and here's the thing: the hardcover book is not available for retail sale. Mm -hmm. So it's only available um, for speaking engagements uh, when I do mm -hmm. speaking engagements, and also for members of uh, the Inner Circle Club, the Summit Club, or the Peak Private Coaching Program. So there's only four ways you can get it. <laughs> I love it. Well, well. Speaking of engagements, before I get you off the show, then you are speaking at the bar and nightclub, yeah, trade show in Vegas. When is that? Yes, yes. Um, when is that? I think it's. I'm March. actually so yeah. 2018. I got a couple things on the calendar already. I will be in Spain. If anybody on the anybody in the audience is overseas in Madrid, I will be in Spain, uh, February uh, 19th to 21st, speaking at the Hospitality Innovation Planet in Madrid. It's probably one of the biggest innovation uh, restaurant or hospitality uh, kind of congresses in the world. It's going to be awesome. And then um, March 5th, uh, actually March March 4th, 5th and 6th, I'll be in New York at the Restaurant Show of New York. 
Um, that's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm speaking on Sunday. I'm talking, I think I'm doing on marketing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the restaurant, uh, the nightclub and bar show is in Vegas. I'll be speaking on Monday the 26th, Las Vegas, Viva Las Vegas. And I'll be doing my menu Jedi mind tricks, using psychology to increase your sales. So love that. I yeah. touch on it a little bit in the book about uh, the Jedi mind tricks, but mm -hmm. at the on the, in the workshops and the live uh, things, I give you a really a little more detail. And also, too, there is a – I always have a nice workbook available. And uh, my workbooks usually like 20, 25-page workbooks. They're big workbooks. So nice. a lot of stuff you can take home with you. And at all those different uh, events, I will be bringing copies of the hardcover book. So, so go if you can. I, yeah, well, here's my thing. If anybody on the show shows up at uh, any of those events and say, hey, I heard you on Andrew's podcast, I will give you a book. Oh. For free. For free. Wow, that's incredibly generous. All right, you, got, well, you heard him. Number one, you got to listen to the podcast. Number two, you got to find me at, a, at one of those shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Where's Waldo. Where's, Waldo? Like, where's Donald? Where's Donald? Where's, Donald? where's oh, the orange book? book? <laughs> yeah. Where's that guy? Where's that guy with my book? Right. I saw him on the podcast. Andrew said I could get a book. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I absolutely am a big fan of everything that you do, and uh, I can't wait it's, it's, to see what happens. It's mutual. Yeah. Yeah. 2018 is going to be an epic year for everybody. Love it.